coming up. I was quickly shocked to learn that I had re-entered middle school, where personalities reigned supreme. I came into the position naively thinking we were all focused on the same goals. But when we allow personalities to interfere, interfere with the, what is right for those who wear the uniform to Canada, we lose the plot. I've been observing the calls for this office to be legislated and report to Parliament. I'm heartened to see Ms. Matheson's bill tabled before the House. It is encouraging that others are now seeing the benefits of having an ombudsman legislated. I provided a summary of the sexual misconduct suspicions against Officer X and forced the Naval Reserve Headquarters to conduct its own internal investigation, which confirmed, quote, all the individuals brought forth allegations that were bundled up with 14 years of multiple allegations and military police investigations against Officer X that had resulted in zero action, unquote. My founded harassment complaint of abuse of power against the unit coxswain who interrogated myself and others resulted in only minor private consequences while he was publicly celebrated. This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. So we, we noted in your testimony before uh, the Access to Information uh, Privacy and Ethics Committee uh, about the ATIP system. Could you summarize your concerns with the ATIP system? To respond to that, I'd separate them both into the access to information system and the, and the privacy system. The access to information system um, is easily defeatable on the basis of the fact that it relies on an honor system. As we heard testimony from the deputy minister, there's no standard procedure under which different groups across the department are required to respond. And so there's, there's ripe opportunity for abuse where records can be withheld, deleted, and very little accountability. In terms of the privacy system, a significant barrier and challenge I'll highlight is that you are required to name the individual record holder in trying to get access to your personal information. So as an example, I would, I would welcome any member of this committee who could name the individual CRA, Canada Revenue Agency employee, who helped process your tax return to know whether you could get information on that under the Privacy Act. Because I can tell you, a victim of sexual misconduct does not have information about the totality of the headquarters and who's involved in their files. Okay, so you've indicated that you've been the victim of privacy breach uh, on your first, you, you said it, per, perhaps two breaches, and your first breach, can you describe how this, how this happened, how you became aware that this... The first breach happened um, when I submitted a harassment complaint and I A-tipped the response because, uh, unfortunately, Commodore Montgomery didn't think that it would be appropriate to give me the... the um, the final decision in one harassment investigation. In this one, against the executive officer I mentioned, the privacy breach happened because the individual improperly retained access and shared personal information that should have been transferred when I transferred units or destroyed. Uh, I had to then A-tip the package that confirmed that. I made a complaint with the appropriate group at the uh, Directorate of Access to Information and Privacy. Uh, and regrettably uh, I'm looking at their recommendation and unfortunately it was one that said that they didn't feel that they needed to take any action because the system under which the information was stored has changed so to the comments that have been made by the minister and the deputy uh, there are no consequences for breach so in the course of, of making an access request did you did you get the, re the information you requested I got the information I requested. Okay. Uh, sometimes it takes two or three approaches or kicks at the can. Okay, but, but, they, but they violated your, your privacy in so doing. One of the documents that was released in the release package was an email that had attached my personal information that was circulated internally, and that's how I knew there was a breach. Wow. What, was what, this? what concerns me about that, sir, I'll also add, is the individuals who sent it and the individual who received my information had all the requisite training, knowledge, and experience as former commanding officers, and in this case now a current commanding officer, that they should have known better. Okay. Uh, if I understood your, your opening statement correctly, are you, are you saying that the, the military police that investigated you were actually con con had a connection to the complaint itself? Not Is the military police. Um, you're so what happens is that under the old system that has since changed, but it did apply to my case of, of sexual misconduct, commanding officers had to lay charges. In other words, the military police had to refer the files back to the units in order to lay a charge, have a charge-laying decision. Uh, as I've raised concerns, this individual, the commanding officer who made the charge-laying decision, which is part of the justice process, was not only present at the event, he is a friend of the accused or a perceived friend, 
and has known him for a long time. And so this is a very clear conflict of interest that not one member in the entire Royal Canadian Navy chain of command apparently was able to read to page three of the report. Mm. So uh, how would you describe transparency in the MP reporting system? It's very difficult. Um, first of all, complainants are not automatically given a copy of their police reports. In fact, I believe there's a box that the military police can check that says complainant not notified. <coughs> I, I truly struggle to understand why that box is allowed to exist. So how does a complainant access a copy of uh, So first of all, you would have to find out that the, the report has concluded, and you don't always get that unless you follow up with the police. Then you would have to go through the access to information system itself to make the request. I believe it took a significant amount of time, maybe up to six months, a year, for me to be able to get that. Um, and I'd like to point out that one of the things that's very difficult about that is in order to make a complaint with the Military Police Complaints Commission, you have one year from the conclusion of an investigation. So if there is a delay in receiving a copy of that report that pushes you outside the one-year time limit, you actually have to get discretionary approval for the Military Police Complaints Commission to investigate. Okay, but all the way along, you're having to act, use the access to information system to get the information that you need to make a proper complaint. 100%. And... Uh, and, and delay is endemic, in, in, would you say, in, in the access to information Absolutely. system? Absolutely. Uh, what, uh, what kinds of, do you get feedback or, or reasons why they won't <coughs> give you the, the information? Uh, sometimes you do get an occasional uh, response from the department saying that they're going to exceed the time limit. I know that an article came out recently saying that they weren't doing that. They started doing that. They've now stopped doing that again. Um, I often follow up with them via email because I know that attempting to resolve the problem is a prerequisite of going to the Information Commissioner or Privacy Commissioner. But let me say that complaining to the Information and Privacy Commissioner is not an exception to getting the information. It is part of the process. You will not get your information unless you make a complaint. I'm hearing from military colleagues that access to cases or files for a military member is actually easy once you have the security clearance you need within defense, the Department of Defense. But when you have access to a member's uh, file, there is no way to track who had access to that file, nor any notes. So anyone can touch or have a look at it without, without the individual being aware. In the healthcare sector, if someone looks at our case file, then there is something in the case file that shows it. Is this something that sounds familiar to you? When it comes to a lot of the case on, in information, I, I appreciate the highlight of the struggle. Um, one of them I can tell you related to the grievance file is, is exactly that, is this, one of the first steps when you file a grievance is that they give you a consent form that gives the department permission to access everything about you. They don't necessarily tell you who's accessing it, what the totality of things that they consider are. I understand that members could then ATIP again, factor in. When, any, anytime I say ATIP, remember there's a delay involved there. ATIP their grievance file to see what's in it. And that's the what is supposed to be the totality of what's considered. So if something's missing from the grievance file, members would have an ability to say, well, no, I, I'm adding in additional documentation. But um, I will say that uh, since the recent article uh, about Officer X in the newspaper, uh, I've been receiving anonymous harassing emails from someone who claims to be um, associated with National Defense Headquarters. And I've asked my chain of command to look in who may have accessed my personal email because it's coming to my personal email. Uh, and they don't even seem to be able to tell me who's been pulling up my file and what's accessed it. So uh, I would certainly hope they'd be able to do that because if there's a group of people you would expect to have accessed my folder and then someone who very clearly I don't know and may not have any reason to have accessed it but did, I'd say the military police owes them a visit. Would you then be making a recommendation as to updating the IT system that would mean that at any point a person would be able to know who would have accessed a member's file? It would be something certainly welcome. Um, the problem, of course, is, is effectively how that would be rolled out. So as an example, in a Naval Reserve Division, you have a ship's office, which is our administrative cell, and they handle all those things in terms of the, the personal files, the administration of a member. Um, 
you could integrate perhaps uh, some means of allowing members to to access that information, um, I would just imagine the department would probably provide an excuse and say, we'll add it to our list of 100 to-dos, and uh, by the time next century we've all forgotten about it, we'll, uh, we'll take it off and no one will notice. The internal report from the Integrated Complaint and Conflict Management Team found and again, you reference this as well, that they had bundled the information and all those allegations up. Uh, it was over 14 years of multiple allegations. Uh, but no action, despite all of that, no action had been taken. And it wasn't, wasn't until that was leaked, all that information was leaked to the media that, that we, we knew about that. You also talked about that connection between transparency and accountability. So can you elaborate a bit more on that, but also the recommendations that you specifically have to ensure justice throughout all of this for survivors? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank you as well for, for even raising and proposing the study. Um, I was glad to see that someone had picked up the torch at the National Defense Committee because certainly um, there's been a lot to talk about in this study for it. Um, recommendations, I mean, I, I certainly don't wish to hold myself out as more of an expert um, than I than I. Or, or holding more value than I can, but I will say that I can, my experience, as you've seen from my remarks, has been very broad. I've touched on a lot of different offices, I've run into a lot of different barriers, and uh, I've basically been fighting as long as it took the entirety of the Second World War. So, you know, it's, yeah, well. Context, yeah. Uh, you know, the comparison isn't a flattering one for our, no. our current forces. Um, but I would say that, that in terms of, of transparency, I mean, fundamentally, this comes down to accountability. I believe that while uh, we can take some of the expertise that Mr. Walburn has and implement recommendations and will continue to evolve and do that over time, at a fundamental level, I think the military has a lot of what it needs to solve its problems. The one thing it doesn't have is accountability of senior leadership. Yeah. Senior and leadership. And internal will. And it, well, that's, exactly, that's where the accountability would come from. Yeah is we have codes of ethics where when you don't respect the dignity of all persons, you can be released. Uh, I struggled to try to find the name of a single senior member of the forces who has been held accountable for anything other than their own personal conduct. In other words, has anyone been relieved of command for the 2,000 sexual assaults that occurred in the last year or the, the year before that? We're still dealing with these problems eight years after Operation Honor? And as I told people, when you look at the facts, is I don't believe the issues that, that may have happened regarding uh, General Vance happened because he was acting alone. There was a, a group of people who may have been signing travel claims. There may have been people who knew about it. I, I, as I said, people, you, need, you want to change the culture? You change the culture by making people more afraid of doing wrong than doing right. That's the current state of affairs. Uh Mr. White, so in the beginning of this study, uh, Deputy um, Minister Bill Matthews came before the, uh, before the committee and he, and he stated that one of the biggest problems that we had in terms of the ATIP system was, uh, and that timing of it and releasing of information was because the, the records weren't digital um, and that they were working on that. But you've suggested that with even the deletion of, of an email when someone retires or, or a change within that system, that there are um, th a, quite a lot of things lost. Should we be concerned about that with that movement towards a digitization? The digitization may help, I think, speed up um, parts of the request. And, and if you're able to digitize and store records so that individuals no longer need to provide them themselves, mm -hmm. I mean, again, the, the process is you make a request, it goes to the corporate secretary and the ATIP team, they figure out where it needs to go, they blast it out, and then individual record holders are supposed to search their emails and provide search terms. I know because I've included my name in one of my own requests to see how that process would unravel. And I tell you, they ask for what search terms did you enter. So, for example, when you're looking for, I don't know, as a public example, Mark Norman, but you've never used Mark Norman's name in an email, Mark Norman's emails or related emails related to Mark Norman are not going to come up in that response. Mm -hmm. So one possible um, solution to part of the problem is that if the department tracks what terms are searched, who is who is solicited for a response, could we not make that available to requesters 
to provide their own degree of accountability and oversight because the documents that I've requested in my case and the cases of, of the related issues you've heard today, all of those things I requested as a double check. I requested a copy of the police report to see who was interviewed as a witness. They didn't interview the commanding officer who was present at the time. So that's an example of how you need to request these records so you can hold the, the, the system accountable. The same way that when you get your grades back in a school assignment, you might want to check your teacher's math because we're human. We make mistakes. Uh, this government came to power, uh, camp just to show campaigned on being the most transparent, transparent government in history. Uh, yes or no, do you think that uh, the government has become more transparent? Uh, it's, a, it's a broad question, to be honest, but I can say that at least how it's trickling through the Department of National Defense is what's transparent are the problems. I would have to ask as compared to what? Compared to, well, they said it was going to get better. Have it got better or got worse? Well, I can only speak from a personal perspective. I would absolutely say it's gotten worse. Okay. I went through a process at the end of my career uh, that wasn't pretty, and I referenced it in my opening comments, and I suggest you go back and look at the transcript. There were about eight or ten people involved in that whole, i got to be careful here, uh, I'm too old to be sued. Uh, <laughs> there were eight or ten people involved Protected at in that situation that, without an exception to the person, every one of them was promoted. No one was ever challenged on the actions that they took and the part that they played in this scenario. And everyone, without exception, was promoted. Mr. Walburn, you, in your opening comments, you talked about a common pattern. You had five things listed as a common pattern, multiple ombudsmen. When we look at the, the situation with the former Chief of Defense Staff, John Vance, and you took that to Minister Sajan at the time, did that follow the same pattern as what you'd experienced and your predecessor experienced up in that point in time? It got worse. As an ombudsman, Part of your role is to advise the minister and seek guidance on files that cannot be solved at the lower level. And you've got to go to the minister with issues that are, sadly, a few of them end of life. Uh, but if you can't get into the minister, if you get shut down, the doors are closed, and someone on staff can refuse the ombudsman a meeting with the minister, and it happened consistently after that episode. Uh, so it not only did the pattern stay the way it was, you know, lather, rinse, repeat, which I witnessed for four and a half years, it got progressively worse after that. So, Mr. Walborn, um, when currently, uh, with the current system works, is the deputy minister, the defense ombudsman, and the judge advocate general report directly to the minister that they are uh, order and counsel appointments. Uh, so, the government is proposing in Bill C-66 of adding to that list the uh, Provost Marshal General, the Director of Military Prosecutions, and the Director of Defense Council will also become order and governor and council appointments, and they will also uh, report to the minister. Now, you've long advocated, as well as your, your successor, uh, Mr. Lick, uh, that the Ombudsman Office should become a fully independent office reporting to Parliament, uh, being properly resourced uh, to remove political interference. Do you believe that having more people report to the minister uh, circumvents, as Mr. White laid out, uh, the chain of command covering up for each other and no accountability, uh, or does it open the door for more political interference? In my opinion, it absolutely opens the door for more interference. Uh, if we put them in the same position, and you know, you say on paper who reports to the minister, uh, I had to go hat in hand to the deputy minister in order to get money, in order to get authority to do staffing. So if we put them into the same situation, I don't know how, in what world you think you're increasing transparency. If you start bringing everyone into the house and putting them under the same set of rules, I just think it's going to get worse, not better. Mr. White, you made 11 recommendations when you appeared before the Ethics Commission, uh, Ethics Committee. Uh, those uh, 11 uh, recommendations still stand? I would say for the most part, they certainly do. Um, I'm, I'm certainly following some of the feedback and the testimony that's come out of the, the previous meetings here and understanding that, again, the government had rejected a, an accelerated process for, for sexual misconduct uh, victims and survivors requesting information. But I think that at the end of the day, there, I would want to have heard in the deputy's response, which I did not hear in his, his defense of that rejection, 
that information that might come into play in a court setting, if there's a statute of limitations or a limitation period or some court timeline that cannot be amended, are you going to tell a sexual misconduct survivor or victim who has to give a victim's impact statement that, I'm sorry, we, we just process everything and all the ATIPs we get in order? So uh, I think to your specific question, if, if the committee thinks they're relevant. That, knowing that we uh, down the road here are going to be studying uh, Bill C-66, which is changes, changes to the military justice system, both of you have extensive experience, and unfortunately, from a negative standpoint with military justice uh, and, and the way it's been carried out. Would you be prepared to appear as witnesses on Bill C-66 as well? If Parliament passes it. it. Well, yeah, yeah, it has to come to committee. Yeah. I'm wondering... Um, if you can kind of explain a little bit further why people are afraid and what are the consequences that could be placed against someone, because I'm kind of new to, you know, the idea of that. So if you could just express that. As I stated before the Ethics Committee, when the question of reprisals came up, reprisals can be varied, they can be numerous, they can come in many forms, and they can be very often hard to detect. Uh, where there is discretion where there is command authority, where there are opportunities to decide things, that is where the root of these abuses of power can exist. And as I said, fundamentally, we're dealing with an accountability abuse of power problem. So, for example, you might complain about something, and then all of a sudden, that posting you really wanted and might have been the most qualified for it, well, that's a discretionary decision, and command has gone a different direction. You know, it could have been the emails and attacking my credibility that I've experienced, for example. Um, the challenge is they're supposed to be the ethos, the military ethos, the code of ethics that is supposed to make people feel like they're doing shame, like shaming them and feeling like they're doing wrong when they step outside the code. But the problem is the incentive structure of the forces. If you're choosing a career long, uh, a career in the forces, a lifelong career, you risk not being promoted. You risk being thrust aside. You miss all kinds of opportunities. And so the incentives could be, I'm just going to keep quiet. I'm just going to keep my head down, do what the boss wants until I'm the boss. And then maybe I could nudge the ball forward on things. And so um, I could answer the question for an hour, but I'll stop there. And I think uh, that exists in, in most organizations, unfortunately. People need to be more afraid of doing wrong than right. Can you give us an example of what exactly would allow that to happen? The short answer is we need to move from a system of whistleblower reprisals to a system of whistleblower protections. Um, I would like to highlight on the record, when I said I've been fighting this for five and a half years, for those who might take issue with the manner in which I've communicated certain information today, I'd like to know why at any point in the last five and a half years this couldn't have been dealt with by all the command authority that exists within the Royal Canadian Navy. So part of it would be to encourage people in a similar position to feel as though there is trust and confidence that issues will be looked at or solved. They could be brought in and explain things. I find a big problem is that the military doesn't want to talk. I mean, we've covered five and a half years of issues effectively in, uh, what, it's been 30 minutes so far maybe? So why hasn't anyone really bothered to pick up the phone and call people and say, let's talk about these issues so that everyone gets buy-in rather than just the decisions communicated and there it is? Uh, that's fundamentally what we need so that, again, the military and the chain can be given a chance to do the right thing and that when people feel like an outsider for doing the wrong thing, we'll know we've succeeded. So I guess the last thing I would just want to say is I think it's it's crazy that Officer X has been promoted after 14 years of history of with sexual misconduct. I don't know who that is, obviously, but um, when things like this happen, what do you think that says about the culture? Too much to answer in 30 seconds. Um, as I said, I, I think fundamentally <clears throat> you're, you need leadership to lead. And I'm, I, you know, my father, before he died, had gifted me a plaque that, that he had on his desk at work. And it says, if you're ahead of me, lead. If you're behind me, follow. And if you're not going to do anything, get the hell out of the way. Title to the study. Um, <laughs> um, Although I did like the proposal for It's Not Our First Rodeo. I did yeah, find yeah. That, was, that was quite good. Competing titles. Uh, Madame Normandine, two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. White. I'd like to hear you about 
the statute of limitations issue, if you can. I think to, to add to that is, again, is part of the concern that, that I think was missing from the official's presentation about grievances, again, is uh, when the, I think it was one of the generals who had responded by saying that, well, you know, there's a, there's a catch-all that says that if you exceed the timeline to file a grievance, of course, it can still be accepted. But it's a discretionary decision. It is not a mandatory, meet these five guidelines and we will, we will accept your grievance late. So if you have, again, bad actors in the system who are, who are abusing their authority or, or just don't want to do the right thing or don't want to err on the side of, of hearing a grievance or entertaining a grievance, they can shut those things down. So that was part of why I'd, I had proposed the idea to say, look, I mean, we have these notice of intent to grieve, we have the grievance timelines, and I've run up, in, particularly in the Naval Reserve, they seem very, very strict when it suits them to shut down a grievance and then say, well, you could have done this, you could have done that. So I think the goal is to try to encourage members, at a, almost like an intervention at an early stage, that if, you, if a member has everything that they need, um, they can proceed with the grievance. And, and to finish the thought, the grievance clock starts at the time of the decision, because that's what you have to grieve, the decision. So if it takes six months to get an access to information request related to the decision, well, I'm sorry, you've exceeded your 90 days. Now, again, a reasonable initial authority might look at that and say, you've made the argument that this was essential information to, con to, to filing a grievance, I'll allow it. And others may say, you know, I don't think that's, that's relevant and throw it out because they can, because it's easy. And I also want to highlight a last point, which is it seemed very flippant almost to hear that the final authority can act as the catch-all solution when, one, the final authority has no maximum time limit to consider requests. But why are we saying it's okay to have a botched or, or uh, invalid initial authority decision? It's like, it's like saying, well, we're going to let you go to court. The trial judge is totally going to butcher it, but don't worry, you can appeal you've denied a second, a first opportunity for review in which it would also have solved the problem much quicker. How is that an acceptable outcome? Thank you. Makes me think of the Trump trials. What tools could help in terms of um, making the military more accountable um, to things like a culture change? Well, I liken it back to when they set up the sexual response center. Uh, we learned very quickly when it was rolled out that it reported in through the chain of command to uh, the chief of defense staff and then functionally in through the deputy minister. Uh, there was a lot of reluctance for members who had experienced this type of behavior to come forward because there was no thought of independence. When, so, you know, it can't be just independence, it also has to be perceived that it's independent. When people look at, and they, especially people who have been aggrieved, uh, they all automatically have a mistrust in the system. And if they think that their concern is not going to be taken seriously and outside the chain of command where it can have a full evaluation, it can be determined on its merits where it should go, um, then there's a reluctance to come forward. And I think by not having that thought that, hey, this person is not tied into the department, though they report through and help and assist the department, they have an option other than having to respond always to the one entity. I think it gives the members, especially this feeling that, hey, there's something I can do, there's somewhere I can go, there's a voice that will hear me, and it's not going to be restricted by any schematic that has been set up by the department. So I just think it, it, it goes to transparency and, and, and perception of transparency. Your time as uh, ombudsman, were there any reports of reprisals from DND or CAF superiors when a service member requested an AT ATIP? Absolutely. And uh, what sorts of reprisals are, are the same type that we're hearing from Mr. White? Absolutely. How should service members be protected from reprisals from their superiors when they request an ATIP? Well, each case in and of itself is different. Uh, some of these things are, are very minor issues that need to be dealt with. It was a clerical error, and some of them are, you would almost think that it was a planned way forward not to release the information. So each and every case was different. Uh, it would depend on the circumstances of the case. Uh, people just not being given the information, uh, being accused of using the wrong search, when you ask for someone by name and they're only referred to by rank. Uh, so those are the types of things. Uh, the Ombudsman did have the opportunity to squeeze some of that information out of the department to help the constituent move forward. 
So ATIP seems to be a very inefficient way of, uh, for a person to, res to obtain the information they need. Uh, are other areas in the public service uh, required to go through the same process to find the documents they need uh, for their cases? As they may be. Once an ATIP request comes in, anyone who's mentioned on that has to be engaged. Uh, the writer of some of this information also has the privilege to say, I know I don't want it released. But is there a process, aside from ATIPs, because this is obviously broken, where, where an employee can or a service member can obtain the documents they need without going through that system, is there another way to do it? Well, it depends which documents they're looking for. If they're looking for access to the personnel record, that's fairly easily done. Uh, but it would depend on what documents they were searching for. In terms of uh, legal uh, records, for example, copies of uh, reports of testimonies when you're, somebody is originally making a report after a, a sexual assault, is that something that they have to uh, ATIP? Uh, should they just be able to get it? Do they need to uh, retain a lawyer to obtain the documents? Yes to all of the above. Uh, it, again, uh, not to be flipped, but it does depend. If it's something that has to do with the member's personnel file, it will be on their file, should be on their file. If it is something to do with an acquisition of inappropriate behavior or sexual misconduct, whatever that may be, that may not be captured on a personnel file and it would end up being an ATIP request. There's not many other ways to get access to that information. So uh, there were, at one point along the way, there was a duty to report any uh, sexual um, assaults. Uh, and here, the the individual did report, yet was in trouble for doing that. Is there a, another way to ensure, aside from going outside the, the military, that instances such as this can be addressed in a proper and timely manner? Look, I think it comes back to what Patrick has already said. We need to talk about accountability. And if we keep rewarding poor behavior, we're going to get the poor behavior. So I think, you know, this is an accountability issue. Uh, I would say, you ask me, in my jaded old age, I would say it all should be outside of the military chain of command, these types of things. Uh, that's not going to happen. So what is another option for us? Uh, the Ombudsman, even when the Sexual Response Centre was set up, we still continue to deal with inappropriate sexual behaviour complaints. So it depends, you know, this duty to report, uh, you know, I think we allow, we need to allow the victims to determine what their self-actualization looks like. What do I want to do and how do I want to do it? It shouldn't be someone else reporting in on you. Uh, so there, there, there's a lot in that. So and there were, were there other reprisals such as Mr. White has uh, experienced in obtaining the uh, access to information reports? Absolutely. So this is business as usual? Absolutely. So uh, still told, we. Again, we should be entitling this not their first rodeo, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> so you've been at this for a number of years. Um, most would point to you and say that you're an expert in this field. When you've implemented the policy changes and you've changed leadership, or you've done both, and you still haven't found that change, w what are the next steps? I think we've talked around it a little bit here today. It's got to be developing a system where we reward proper behaviour and we punish inappropriate behaviour. When I talked about my own personal case, there were eight or ten people involved in that scenario. Every one of them got promoted. So what do you think their underlings now look at as the proper way to get moved ahead in the organization? You know, he talks about inside the military chain of command that, well, discretionary, he didn't get the posting. And then he sees how that, you know, his, his colleague sees how that works. When he gets in a chance to be in a place of command or obtain something for their benefit, they're going to use the same behavior. It's, you know, we all talk about culture change and we're going to change the culture we go on ad nauseum about it. But what do we do? We don't go after what's causing the culture to be broken, which is the behavior of individuals in the, in the culture. So unless we want to weed those people out and start rewarding proper behavior and punishing bad behavior, uh, then we can talk about culture till the cows come home, but it's not going to change. And thank you for that. And, and we've, seen, um, we've seen that culture change happen in other areas. You know, I'll, I'll point to the entertainment industry as, as a great example. Uh, amateur sports, I think we've made strides here in Canada in terms of uh, encouraging people to, um, to report. And Mr. White, you, you talked about encouraging people to report and the reprisals that um, came with um, trying to seek out more information, right? The more information we have when there's an investigation, um, the better opportunity we have to um, pass judgment on those who have, um, have done something wrong. Can you talk about um, the importance of um, having a, a system in place that allows people and encourages people actually 
to proactively report wrongdoing when they see it? I mean, I think the basics of the system exist. Um, really what the system, I would say, that needs to be fixed is the people system, the people version of that system, which is making sure that when you um, come and report to someone that they're willing to take it. I mean, look, my interpretation of a lot of the obligations of superior officers is that if a subordinate came to me and had reported wrongdoing and I reported to my boss and I was not satisfied that my boss was going to do the proper thing, I actually would have an obligation, not an option, not a, not a chance, but an obligation to take that further. In my particular case, I'm the most junior member, the person who is victimized in this sort of situation, and I've had to fight every step of the way when my no, that is, go as I've given you the names of all the commanding officers and superior officers who have knowledge of this, why is it being driven by those individuals? So in terms of a system, what is severely lacking is effectively an internal champion or people who wouldn't be punished for saying, I respectfully disagree with the boss's opinion, I need to go talk to their boss. It, it's seen inherently as insubordination. Can I, can I just add to that? Absolutely, you asked yeah. why Hollywood and athletics, how it's changed. It's changed because the public late spotlight got shown on it. That's why it's changed. It's not changed because we allowed an internal unit inside either one of those entities to report upon itself. That's not how it changed. It changed because the public became outraged about the behavior, and that's how it changed. And why did it become outraged? Because it became public knowledge. It got put above the tabletop and said, here it is in its ugly truth. Let's deal with it. You know, we're talking about culture. We're talking about cover-up. And uh, one witness uh, on the study already said that there's a culture of over-classification at uh, National Defense, uh, so that they don't have to release it. They can hide it behind secret and top secret. And uh, you, We've already mentioned the use of code names, uh, like uh, when Admiral Norman was described uh, or referred to as the Kraken, although uh, some may say that that is the common code name used for the commander of the Royal Canadian Navy, but uh, regardless, um, it does, uh, and then on top of that, as you've experienced, Mr. White and, and Mr. Walborn, that they uh, then rag the puck when it comes down to slowly trickling out uh, information under aid tips and uh, uh, even requests for um, papers coming from committee. Uh, they take their sweet time about it. So what can we do um, to uh, change that culture and provide the checks and balances to ensure that there is accountability in leadership of bo both the Canadian Armed Forces side and the department side to ensure that access to information is released in a timely manner. How do we fix this? You guys have both been on the inside. Look, not to repeat myself, but let me repeat myself. <laughs> We're talking about people who have been put in positions of authority. There are guidelines on what they're supposed to do. They're well written. When I first joined the public service after a, a, a long stint in the private sector, uh, should have stayed there. But when I came into the public sector, what I was given was a binder about this sick. And it didn't tell me just about how I should behave. It told me how I should dress, what I should do with my family. It was like a binder of about 200 pages of how an executive should present themselves. And in that, we talked about ethics and being accountable, understanding the law, doing the right thing. And it was an ethos. I said, well, what a place. This, let's rock and roll here. But it's funny, the higher you get up the ladder, the thinner the ear gets. I'm sure that's what happens. And the blood rushes to their heads or, or their egos. But we have a system in place. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We have the public... The Service Disclosure Act, if someone wants to blow the whistle on something, but we see that a system abused. We have an ATIP process that is supposed to follow a step-by-step -step logical format in order to release information. It's not followed. It's circumvented by people in the system. So how do we change the culture? I'll go back to it again. We've got to start rewarding proper behavior and punishing bad behavior. Why do we promote people when they do the wrong thing? And others who come forward and offer themselves up to say, listen, guys, this is what's going wrong. Can we get a little help here? Those people are turned upon. Uh, you absolutely have a fundamental flaw here, but it's not with your policies. Your policies need updating. Sure, they do. And you need to adjust a few and add a few things to it and bring in a few more nuances and codicils on there. But what we have to get at is the behavior of the people who are currently sitting in the seats. You know, I, I read the transcripts of about... Uh, 
Mr. Matthews, when he was here and he was asked a question about the ombudsman, well, we have no control over the ombudsman's office, and then in the next statement, well, we're thinking about loosening up some of the controls. Those two comments don't make sense. How is it you have no control, but you're going to loosen the controls? So it's, it's one or the other. So we don't challenge people when, when, they, when they do things that are inappropriate and, and use and manipulate the rules and regulations in place to suit their needs. I just think we've got to get back to that. Both of you, are that it's a sad state of affairs when the information commissioner actually has to take uh, the Department of National Defense and, and the Minister of National Defense to court? Absolutely. And it was a sad state of affairs when I had to challenge the minister publicly to get information on the transition process of the Canadian Armed Forces. So here we go yet again. So it's not like, oh, this just happened yesterday. This is pattern behavior. And if we allow it to continue, we'll be having this conversation. Patrick and I, Patrick will be my age when we come back the next time. God bless you. So I like your hair, but <laughs> <laughs> took took me an hour. Uh, but if we don't go after the people who are in position and challenge them to do the right thing, teach them how to do the right thing, and reward them for doing the right thing, everyone at D&D in the executive cadre is getting a bonus this year. I guarantee you. I'll let you get in on this, um, but, you know, there is an ethos, right? There is the code of service discipline. There are the, the well, the KR and O's now, but, you know, they, 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 they're supposed to de describe how our leadership within the Canadian Armed Forces is supposed to, to act, and yet the ones at the top are the ones in your experience and others, is, are they're the ones that are ignoring it. From the privacy breach report that I received from the department that said what they were basically in mitigation, 25... Because One Mr. Sentence. Bazan has blown through his time quite nicely. Understood. 25 August 2023, Member B was reminded that according to Section 7 use of the Privacy Act, the use of personal information must be consistent with the purpose for which it was collected and that retention of performance-related information must be in accordance with current systems, policies, and standards. The punishment for breaking the Privacy Act is being reminded what's in the Privacy Act? For that reminder. I will reflect on uh, a bill, C-66, uh, that the Military Justice Modernization Act, uh, that the government proposed uh, to increase the independence of the military justice actor like Provo Marshal to ensure that they are not influenced by the chain of the command. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts. Well, thank you for the question. I, first, I would say that I haven't actually brushed up too much on the military justice system itself, as you heard that mentorship was the response from the recommendation by the military police for, for charges. So I haven't actually gotten to the trial uh, phase. Um, I would just say that, I mean, in my, in my corporate law practice, we deal with issues of fiduciary duties of directors and that there are stockholders who can appoint directors to the board of a company but that the director themselves, regardless of their affiliation with the stockholder, must act in the best interests of the corporation. So the appointment process itself doesn't necessarily mean that an individual is in a, a conflict of interest if there is a very strict code of ethics and there is enforcement of that code. A breach of fiduciary duties is a cause of action in court of law. So a director that breaches those duties can be personally liable for individual breaches and so that means that if they're acting inappropriately, they can be held accountable by other stockholders or they can be held accountable by other actors who have been harmed. The same principle can apply here. So I will say that I, I did read with interest uh, a, a, an assessment of Bill C-66 by someone in, in the profession, uh, much more expertise than me, Rory Fowler, uh, a well-known name, I believe. And I think to his point is that I'm not sure that changing the appointment process is truly going to fix issues of independence when you could in fact empower someone either with positive reinforcement or the negative reinforcement that comes by clearly laying out ethical issues. In other words, if they had received pressure from, let's say, the chief of defense staff to act inappropriately, if they had a reporting mechanism themselves, an ethical obligation to resist that sort of pressure, they could be supported and there would be no need to change that appointment process. But again, I will qualify that, that I have not brushed up too much on that aspect of the military justice system. Uh, how has your experience with the uh, Canadian Armed Forces grievance system affected your ability, or I would say your willingness to continue to serve? Um, have you spoken to individuals uh, in a similar situation as yours? 
the grievance system is presently almost the bane of my existence. It is a source of aggravation, frustration. I mean, the, the problem is that you require members. So I, I'll, I'll say two things. First of all, I'll, I'll back by saying you need to put yourself in the perspective of the most vulnerable kind of person. Respectfully, that's actually not me. I'm an attorney. I have some legal knowledge. I'm not the most vulnerable kind of person. The most vulnerable kind of person may be the 16-year-old who gets parental consent to join. They may be the person who is so affected by aggravated sexual trauma that they can't even put their hand on the doorknob to get into work or may vomit when putting on their uniform. Just as an example, if you design a system in mind so that individuals like that can navigate it, rather than requiring us to be a, a Rory Fowler or Michelle Drapeau, you will succeed in having a system that works for everyone. The grievance system as it stands requires individuals like myself and others to spend our limited part-time, our free time, to fight a system that is paid and employed full-time to fight back. That's the challenge I have. I am not an expert on military regulation, military law, et cetera, et cetera, but they have access to all of those resources. They also have access to legal advice on those issues. Members don't. So the grievance system and what annoys me more than anything is that senior members who have never been affected in the way that some of us have flippantly just say, if you don't like it, grieve it, knowing full well that they've never had to go through those processes or maybe they did in a minor way and had success. So all of these issues, again, I, if I could leave the committee with one final point to, to think about is if you really want to get to culture change, you really want to solve these issues, you need to look at every single aspect of the system and understand how it feeds back in. Everything from the honors and recognition system, everything from the promotion system, the grievance system, the military police system, all of it. But all of it with a central view of what would the effect be on these sorts of things that we get to. One of the recommendations is the ombudsman reporting directly to the House rather than to the minister. And what would you, your expectation be as to the role of members, specifically opposition members, if the ombudsman could report to the House rather than to the minister? What would be the role of opposition members in that context? Well, as for the construct of how it would work, I mean, the ombudsman is still going to report through the minister. Uh, the work that's done inside the CAF would have to come through that chain. If there is no response, uh, you know, where does it go from there? The corrections ombudsman right now uh, reports into the, through the minister. He goes to the commissioner. If there's no a action, he goes to the minister. And if not, it goes from there to the House. It gets tabled, and there's light shone on it. How we want to do that at the end of the day, is it a committee? Is it taken to the House? I mean, I think those are details that need to be determined on the best way forward. There are several options. There, are, If we look at the five eyes, they have various... Uh, applications of this. So I think there are ways of doing it, but I think it would remain on what's the capacity and where should it go. That's how I'd like to see it reviewed. Uh, in a couple months, Mr. Lick will be retiring uh, from his role as ombudsman. Um, we're in mid-April. I, I had asked him, he is certainly very concerned in the fact that still no job poster is up on, on PCO website for his replacement. Um, are you concerned about that? And what do you think needs to happen to ensure a transparent, open process for choosing the next ombudsperson? Well, rest assured, I'm not concerned that I'm applying for the position. <clears throat> <laughs> but I think it's absolutely critical that there is a competition. I hear the scuttlebutt on the road, and I'm sure it's around this table. People know various levels of it. There's a thought process that an ombudsman is going to be appointed, and I shudder to think what that's going to do to this office. If we appoint an ombudsman, let me tell you, and we all know how it works, there is a quid pro quo. Somewhere down the road, there's going to be time to pay back. I question the independence of the office, so I really, really hope at the end of the day, if nothing else happens, that when we go looking for the next ombudsperson, that there is an open competition where those who wish to apply can apply, and based on merit and ability, the right person is selected for the job. So I really, really hope, and you talk about transparency, appointing an ombudsman, I think, goes contrary to any definition that you will find of transparency. We have this, the, the government has been in office for nine years now, almost, and had promised improvement on openness and transparency. Uh, if there was clear leadership at the ministerial level to demand accountability and demand openness and transparency, uh, would it be fair to say that we'd have it by now? 
Look, I think we have a perfect opportunity, following on to Ms. Matheson's question, the minister now has an opportunity to pick the next ombudsperson coming into the organization. And if we're going to go out and just pick someone off a list or find someone we think is qualified and put them in there, so I, it goes back to leading by example. The proper behaviour should be rewarded. Uh, and if we continue to allow behaviour that is not at the level that we expect, as a taxpayer, as I expect from this group in Parliament, uh, then we need to challenge that. Uh, Mr. White, do you see any evidence that uh, there has been a demand from the minister to insist on improvements to openness and transparency? The evidence has borne out in the actual day-to-day -day life in the department. I think I'd be able to comment more so on, on just the the effect. I mean, look, I, I empathize, to be honest, with everyone around this table in a sense of I don't think there's a single person, even outside of the table, but in the entire room, that would want sexual misconduct in the military, that would want a dysfunctional military. So I, I appreciate that the challenge might surpass one government to the next as we're all, you're, you're trying to take your ministerial orders and filter them down. I just know that regardless of effort, I don't think it's working. Right. I mean, nobody has ever... Oh, am I? Oh, okay. okay, that's... Ms. Lalonde, two minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, I'm going to try to give both of you a minute, but uh, Mr. Walbert, and I'm going to be very quick. Um, during your time as the Ombudsman, uh, could you tell us a little bit about some of the types of research and studies uh, that you conducted in that role, please, very briefly? Oh, wow. Uh, we've looked at just about every aspect of the military, uh, reserves, Canadian Rangers, Junior Rangers, cadets, uh, transition, uh, mental health, support for families. We've done, uh, it was such a broad base. We looked at just about every aspect we think that got back to the members' well-being. A lot of time with families, a lot of time with reservists because they had not received the attention, so it was across the board. Thank you very much. And, and Mr. White, I really, left in white, I really want to give you the last minute or so of this committee in term of I know you brought in recommendations so I'm going to leave you tell us what else do we need to do to uh, ensure um, uh, more fairness. Uh, well I think when I looked at the minister's remarks and he commented uh, I believe to quote I also understand my responsibility for holding my officials to account unquote. I would certainly hope the minister is supported in that in that opportunity because this is what's this is what being a minister is about and I think fundamentally uh, I won't speak for Mr. Walburn but regardless of what people say I think individuals like myself and Mr. Walburn are trying to make things better. Thank you. With that we're adjourned. Till after the vote. <laughs>